Hello everybody and welcome to this comprehensive video where I'm going to be talking about the Bosch GMF 1600 router, otherwise known in the US as the Bosch MRC, let me get this right, 23 EVSK. In this video, I want to talk a little bit about the features of it and also my thoughts on those features, kind of like a overview and a review all in one. So by the end of the video, you will know if this tool is for you or not. Let's get going. So I've got a ton of stuff crammed into this video to share with you. However, before we get stuck into any of that, I just need to cover a few disclaimers first. Firstly, many of you are aware that Bosch sponsored this channel with tools and equipment. However, this tool was purchased before any of that happened. This was purchased with my own money. I chose to get this tool over the likes of Festool, Makita, DeWalt, Triton, Ryobi, whatever. This was the one that I went for and hopefully this video will explain to you why. Secondly, in the description below, I've popped an affiliate link for this tool. So if you fancy buying it after watching this video, then by following that link below to the relevant sales page, I will get a small commission of the sale at no extra cost to you. So if you wanna support the channel, if you wanna send a tip as a thank you for the recommendation, that is the way to do it. And if you're worried about the legitimacy of the whole Bosch thing and the whole affiliate link kind of thing, there is also an affiliate disclaimer down there, about a five minute read, and that covers everything to do with the companies that I work with and how I work with them and how I'm able to make these reviews as legitimate as possible. That covers everything, let's get stuck into it. So just to make sure we are on the same page with things, keep in mind that there are two versions of this router that are sold which are very easily mixed up with one another. You've got the GOF 1600 and you've got the GMF 1600. The GOF just includes the motor unit, the plunge base, and then a few other accessories as well. The GMF, which is what we're reviewing today, includes all of that, plus the fixed base, which has a load of features included. We'll obviously be covering those today, but just keep that in mind. Don't go ahead and buy the GOF kit and then expect to find a fixed base in there. You have to buy the GMF kit or the, uh, what is it, the MRC23 EVSK if you're in the US, if you want to get both of these bases and the extra accessories. So firstly, let's have a look at the beans behind this. This is the motor unit. The 1600 in the GMF 1600 name is referring to the wattage of the motor. So 1600 watts in this. If you get the US version, it's about 2.3 horsepower. And 1600 watts is kind of middle ground for a router of this size. If you compare it to the Festool OF 1400, then you've got 1400 watts. So a little bit lower. Whereas if you compare it to the likes of uh, Makita and a DeWalt, those are more towards 1800 watts. But for me, I've never really needed much more than 1600. Never noticed there's any lack of power or slowing down of this machine. I find that there's plenty of headroom in it and there's also circuitry in here that allows it to provide constant power to allow for fluctuations in you know material density or depth of cut and things like that. It will pretty much maintain a constant speed in use, which is really nice. Now this router obviously has a variable speed as well, controlled by this dial. This will go anything from 10,000 RPM at the lower speeds all the way up to 25,000 RPM to account for your different diameter cutters and materials and things like that. And the nice thing about this is that dial is recessed into the casing, which means you're less likely to knock it and accidentally speed up or slow down the cutter. And it also comes with half inch and quarter inch collets and can obviously be fitted with an eight millimeter collet if you need one of those as well. But perhaps the best thing about this router is the fact that it comes with the two bases. This makes it incredibly versatile for so many applications. And again, I will be covering those throughout this video, but as a brief overview, plunge base for majority of your routing operations, and then a fixed base, which can obviously be used for things where you don't need to do that plunge cut to enter the cut. And also this can be permanently mounted under a router table using some cool little features, which I will explain later. Now, what you may or may not have noticed is nowhere on this motor unit is there a switch. The only thing you have is this low voltage interface here. So firstly, what that means is you can't just turn this motor unit on and then try and use it as an engraver. But secondly, what it means is when you get this into a base, it means that in order to turn the tool on, you use one of the triggers on the back of the handles. So this can be found on both the plunge base and if we flip over the fixed base as well, we've got one here. And these triggers can be locked while powered by simply pulling the trigger and then pressing that button there. And to release it, you just pull the trigger. So in, in, done, and that machine will stay running without having to constantly worry about pulling that trigger in. 
and the motor is locked into the base by using this strap here and that locks it very securely. In order to take the motor out, unlock the strap, lift it up and this tab needs to also be disengaged, kind of a safety catch kind of thing. And on the fixed base, there is actually three locks on it. Let's just get this in here. So once that's in the body of the tool, lock it down and then that will clamp the motor unit into the base to unlock it undo the strap and then you need to push on this tab here which is the micro adjust lock and then the safety catch is the final one that you need to disengage. The reason the fixed base has three locks is because of the addition of this tab which basically allows quick adjustment of the motor unit up and down without having to constantly try to mess around with the micro adjust on here. This will index in three little slots in the side of the motor unit and allow quick adjustment between those, which is incredibly useful when this is mounted into a router table. But we'll focus on the whole router table stuff later. Let's look at the plunge base for the time being. Now the plunge base obviously has everything you'd expect to find on a normal router. So you've got the stepped depth stop here. So when you want to go down to a final depth in increments, you can obviously use that little adjuster there. And there is also two that are controlled by screws. So if you really need to dial in the exact amount, then you can do so using those. You've obviously got the depth stop rod with a sliding scale to zero the cutter at different depths. The nice thing about this is it also has this little dial on top, which allows you to fine adjust the depth of the cutter. And once again on this, it has both a metric and an imperial scale as well. And uh, now when we turn it round, firstly notice how the cable is on this sort of ball and socket joint kind of thing. This is very helpful when you've got extraction hoses protruding out the back of this and you want to get it to trail to either the left or right of it. You've obviously got the trigger there, which we've already discussed. It means that when you operate the tool, you can keep two hands on it rather than try and find a switch on the motor unit. It's all done with your hands in place. And then finally, a feature that I really like about this is the plunge lock lever is self-tightening. So on most routers, you have to unlock the cutter and then plunge down to the required depth and then lock it off. On this one, however, it self-tightens because it's on a spring. So if I loosen it, I can plunge it down and then locks. Basically, it means you can really carefully plunge this into material and then not have to worry about taking your hands away from the tool in order to lock it down. That is pretty secure as it is. If you do want to add a little bit of extra security to it, just give it a little tweak like that and that is more than enough with this. But realistically, there is plenty of locking power behind that self-tightening lock really useful. In addition to that, you've got 76 millimeters of travel from the top of the plunge all the way to the bottom, which is a really nice feature. It's not something you get often on a router of this sort of size. And then you may have noticed on the back of the plunge base, there is a flat edge just in case you want to run this against a straight edge or something like that. And if we flip it around, there's an arrow on the front here, which shows the direction of rotation with the cutter. It is not the direction that you need to feed the router in when you're cutting. That may catch people out, so I just thought it would be something that would be worth stating in this video. So all in all, I think the design of the plunge base on this is absolutely brilliant. Next, let's move on to the fence. This will simply slide into either side of the plunge base or even the fixed base if you want to use that with one of the fences. And on this, the bars are long enough to accommodate two fences should you wish to have support from both edges if you're working on a narrow face such as the side of a door or something like that. So the fence is pretty simple. Simply lock it down on here first and that will allow you to sort of get your coarse adjustment, let's say. And then on the side of the fence, you have got this fine adjustment as well. So in order to make that work, loosen off the two that are closest to the tool. And then by spinning that, you see that you're able to move the router in and out. What I also like about this is the fact that they've provided these second locks as well. So let's say you're creeping this router up to a line and you're turning that adjustment and you're ooh, five millimeters, one millimeter, very close. And then you run out of adjustment. Instead of having to back off the tool and then reset the fence and all that, simply lock these two ones closer to the tool loosen the ones further away, back off the adjuster a bit, and you see I'm doing this, and this isn't actually moving the tool anymore with regards to the offset from the fence, but it is shifting this part back. Then lock those again, loosen these off, and then you've got more adjustment to play with. So it's really good in those situations where you're creeping up to a line and then you just run out of adjustment. 
you can just sort of quickly make up for it by doing that. And on this dial, there is also a scale in both imperial and metric, so you can see exactly how much you are offsetting the fence by. So flipping this over now, this fence also includes an extraction shroud that allows you to extract dust extremely close to the cutter and provide maximum suction exactly where you need it. Unfortunately for me, I've lost the two nuts that attach this to the fence, but these are nothing more than M5 or M4 nuts or something like that. But these are simply attached on the back end of these screws, which have torx heads on them and if you loosen all of those off these also allow full adjustment of the black jaws here just in case you need support over a longer edge or you need clearance for a wider cutter in the center those can obviously be offset to wherever you need them to go and then by attaching the shroud on the back edge of it with those nuts that will lock these in position and also that shroud in place. Now this point I bring up about losing the components to attach that shroud to the fence is one of my dislikes about this router. I will start it off on a positive note. The amount of shrouds and extraction attachments that you can get for these is unbelievable. I used the Festool OF 1400 and the OF 1010 for years while I was training at Riketwood and Festool are known for their brilliant extraction and pretty much dust free with regards to a lot of their tools, be it sanding, routing, their track saws, they have got that reputation about being completely dust free. And to be honest, this Bosch is the same, if not better. The fact that you've got these two overhead shrouds for the, each of the cutters on both the plunge and the fixed base, and you've also got this shroud that fits on the bottom of the fixed and the plunge base means that the cut is completely sealed off in this unit. What I don't like about it compared to the Festool, let's say, is that these are attached by nuts or by using these little twisty screws which are provided with the router. This slows down the process with adding these extraction adapters and has in some cases caused me to be a little bit lazy with it. You know, maybe I haven't been able to find these or perhaps it's just a quick operation or something like that. However, in the past, I know that I used the Festool OF 1400 with extraction exclusively. There was never a time where I didn't have it attached and that was because it was just just so quick and easy to attach it, mainly due to the fact that it was completely toolless. The clamping action in those was actually built into the extraction accessories themselves rather than be these tiny screws that someone like myself will very easily misplace. But despite the fact they are a little bit fiddly to attach, these extraction accessories are extremely efficient and very good once fitted. So now let's have a look at changing cutter. So with the router, Bosch advertised that this has got a flat top on it. So when you take the motor out of the base, you can change that cutter by resting it on the base like that. And then in this case, we've got a half inch collet. So let's get a rebate cutter in there. On this version, the GMF 1600, we have got a spindle lock. However, I'm led to believe that the version in the US, the MRC, doesn't have a spindle lock. Instead, it's supplied with two spanners that are used to unlock the collet. And to be honest, I think I would actually prefer that on this router. The reason being with this, let's have a look and get this cutter in there. We'll pop it in and just get it in at the correct height according to the lines on the cutter. Get that locked down and then find my spanner. Let's get it locked like that. Now with this, Yes, it's great that there is a flat base on it. That makes it really useful and the cutter's right there in front of you. But there is nowhere on this to hold it while you tighten it and get a good clamp in it. By the time you get enough force, your hands start slipping and it really, in my case, it starts cramping up my wrist trying to actually hold that in place. You could obviously lay it flat and try and do it, but I don't like doing that just because it might start putting pressure on that ball and socket down there and thus cause damage to the cable. So for me, I sometimes find it easier to actually put this into the base and then it can sort of rest on the handles and use those as a point to fight against that rotational force. But it also comes down to removing the cutters. It can be quite difficult to find an easy way to undo it. But you see, it can just be a little bit difficult to try and grip that unit while undoing the cutter. So for me, let's just take that out and pop it into the base lock it in, bring it all the way up. If you put it flat like that, then you've still got full access to the spindle lock. You can still easily get the cutter in there and you've got pretty good access to the collet as well. And I can now use this handle down here as a point to lever against and it makes it pretty easy to get a solid lock on there. So next, let's go back to the fixed base. So as I've already explained, nice and easy to detach that motor unit, bring along the fixed base and then drop that straight into there. Now, what I'm about to show you here is the main reason why I chose this router over all the other choices that I had available at the time. Now you've seen how easy it is to detach the motor unit and swap bases. So that means that you can have 
the plunge base for all of your work on top of the workbench because for me like I use these 95% of the time so the fact that this covered 95% of tasks meant that I could dedicate this fixed base to be permanently attached under my router table inverted like that so now I've effectively got two routers for the price of one because quite often someone will buy a half inch router and have that permanently mounted under their router table and then we'll have a separate router for use on top of the workbench for this I've got two of them. So with this suspended under the router table, firstly, unclip that, and then gravity is gonna pull it down to the next section, which means you undo that. And then you've obviously got the safety catch at the end, which will then allow the motor to drop out of the router table while this is still permanently fixed under there. Makes it so quick and easy to change between the two operations without having to unstrap your half inch router from underneath the router table and then flip it round. So then you're using it upright and then you realize, oh, hang on, I need to do a little bit more under the router table. So then you've got to get that fixed under there again and get all the screws in place. This just stays fixed. Dum, 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 unlock those three things and then out comes the motor unit, strap it into your plunge place and vice versa. It is so quick and easy between the two. And not to mention the fact that on this fixed base, let's just get that in there again. You may have noticed that this also has a micro adjust from above, but it's also turning down here. So if you flip this upside down, there's an Allen key slot to accept the supplied Allen key. And then by adjusting that, you can see that we're changing the offset of the base from the cutter. So you've got a rise and fall from above the table included in this base. So to put this little feature into perspective, if you were to buy a dedicated router elevator that has this adjustment via a plate that's inserted in the top of a router table and has like chain drive and everything, that will probably cost you anywhere from, let's say, 200 pounds all the way up to 300 quid possibly even more if you wanted that dedicated mechanism that will obviously fit any router so not only does buying this router save you from having to fork out on that second router so you can have one under the table and one on top of the table but it also means you don't have to fork out and buy that extra router lift mechanism if you want to have the luxury of being able to adjust the depth of cut from the top of the router table rather than like try and get under here and find your adjustments and maybe even try and fight the gravity of the plunge action, which is even worse if any of you have experienced that in the past. Having that adjustment above the table is so useful and makes setup of these things an absolute breeze. Perhaps the only thing that I dislike about this is when mounted under the router table, let's say I've opted to mount it this way round so that when it's under there, I can easily change the variable speed. It means that all the unlocking mechanisms are at the back of the router and you have to kind of fumble around and find that one to initially unlock it and then this one to do the second unlock and then the safety tab at the bottom you know all while reaching around and trying to do it blind eventually you get a feel for it it really is a minor thing but it might be a case of weighing up do you want access to this easier or do you want access to that easier the second one is the lift mechanism is closer to the back of the router so you have to make sure that you set the height of the cutter before putting the fence on because if this is the front of the router table and then you've got the fence that slides up you then don't have access to this adjustment afterwards so again for me i've got used to it i've got used to setting the height of the cutter before actually setting the fence that way i can do all of this adjustment that's needed make sure that's right and then slide the fence up and lock that into position however if i was to do this again i would definitely have this side facing me because then you've got these unlocks and everything right there in front of you you've got the rise and fall on the side closest to you and you've also got the trigger right there which is quite easy to get to as well so if we look at my router table there's the access hole and you see the fence will hide that. Now there is an easy way for me to fix this. I could just take that insert plate and then rotate it 180 degrees and drop it back in, but then the logo is up here and is upside down and can't be having that. I can't be having that. I would rather make it difficult for myself than have the logo upside down priorities eh? so yeah if you do choose to go for this router after watching this video i would definitely recommend having the back of the router facing you when under the router table and then you've got the locks you've got the adjustment and you've got the on switch facing you when it's under there and you might have to sort of reach around and mess around with the variable speed by feel or you could just drop it out the motor unit adjust it while it's in your hands and then pop it back in there when you're ready whatever works but if i was to install this again that is what i would do so before we go ahead and turn this thing on i just want to cover the guide bushes real quick and then I will uh, show you this thing in use. So I've got the motor dropped into the plunge base and we're going to be attaching a guide bush. The guide bushes will also attach to the fixed base, but I'm just going to demonstrate it on this one in this case. 
Now, this is a bit of a weird shape. The locking mechanism on the Bosch ones is a little bit unusual. In order to attach it, first thing you need to do is attach this to the Perspex base of the router. And this is done so using two tiny countersunk Phillips head screws. Can't believe I haven't lost these yet, to be honest. I really can't believe it. So those are simply screwed through the Perspex base and fixed into position like that. And then that's attached this, which is a spring-loaded lock, as you can probably hear. So if we flip that on the bottom like that and then do this, you can see that it rotates it. And all you do with that is unlock it, pop the guide bush in, and then let it release. And then that's locked in there. So it makes it really quick to change around these guide bushes and is really, really handy if you're swapping sizes often. Now I've heard and read a few things about these guide bushes locking off center with the Bosch routers. It's not something I've ever experienced, but it's definitely a problem out there. Now, I don't know if Bosch have always done this or not, but with my router, they supplied this, which is a centering cone. Nothing more than a quarter inch shank and a half inch shank with this cone which can be attached facing either direction. And to be honest, this is something that you can use on any router if you're having problems with centralizing that guide bush. It, you know, half inch and a quarter inch is standard. The way this works is we need to clamp this in the collet first. So I'll just lift it up, get that under there like this. Doesn't need to be over tightened at all. And then get it on its back. And then by loosening off this Perspex base, it's been machined with a little bit of side to side movement in it to allow for centralization of this guide bush. All we'll do is plunge the base down, until you see it sit flat on that cone in the center. And then while it's down, that's where you can lock it in place and you can be sure that the next time you add that guide bush, it's gonna be central. Now, one thing I have done here, let's just take this out. That's obviously a really good feature. Being able to attach and detach these quickly is something that a lot of other routers don't have the luxury of. Some of them need to be like screwed into position and things like that. For me, what I did in order to cut down on trying to store different size guide bushings is I purchased this, which is a threaded guide bush kit. And in my case, it's just stored in a nicely fitted container and contains all the sizes that I'm likely to need. In order to make that work, I've got this, which is a guide bush adapter. This has exactly the same outside on it, except it is made to accept one of these guide bushes. So if I just carefully pop that in there, I can now easily and quickly change size of guide bush by slotting that in there and then tightening this nut on the back so there you go there's that one locked in and then you can loosen that off and let's say i needed to change it to a i don't know what's that a 12 millimeter that stays in there and then we'll just tighten that into the base of the guide bush adapter it's a really good system if you're constantly trying to change around between different size guide bushes like i say with this it's not a huge issue because this is a quick change guide bush and makes the process very fast but if you want an easy way of storing all these different sizes without them rattling around and getting mixed up then that's pretty much the sole reason i got this is because it just stores it all in a nicely displayed fashion and if i just take this out again even if if you don't go for this Bosch router today, you can get these adapters to fit your Makitas and your DeWalt's and your Ryobi's and Elu's and everything like that. They just have a slightly different rim that fits into the base of your router. And then you have full access to all of these different sizes and a few more as well. So that's another nice little tip for if you're looking for ways to improve your guide bush selection, whether you go for this router or not. There is a link to this kit in the description below. Again, it's an affiliate link. So I'll get a small commission as a result of the sale at no extra cost to you. But now let's get this thing set up for a cut. So I think we'll just set it up to do a simple groove down this length of plywood because that's what the majority of us use routers for, let's be fair. So I'm going to swap this round to the quarter inch collet to start with. So just unscrew that and then pop my quarter inch one on. Again, this was included in the box with the router. And you see I'm doing this with the motor in the base so that I can use that handle as leverage in order to get a decent clamp on it. I'm not over tightening when I do this. It just gives you a better resistance against that rotation that wants to happen. Okay, and now to attach extraction to this, this is something that caught me out when I first purchased the tool, but I've since got to grips with it. This is the adapter that is made to be fitted with the plunge base. And on this one, it is solid around the entire circumference, meaning that if I want to get that in now, I can't because the cutter's in the way and I'm not able to lift it up high enough in order to get that under there. So previously, I would always put the cutter in first and then think, oh, I've got to get the cutter out now in order to get that in there. But then I realized that I was just being thick. All you do is unlock the strap at the back, lift up the tool, 
put it in and then drop it down and voila, it's in position. It was something that I always saw as a big drawback to this extraction attachment because comparing it to the Festool OF 1400 and I think the 1010 has it as well possibly, on this adapter there's sort of this sliding window kind of thing that you can open up, slot onto the cutter and then close it around the opposite side. So it makes the process pretty quick, but realistically, once I've got my head around the fact I can just do that, then yeah, it's pretty easy, as you can see. Now, when I'm operating the tool, I'm gonna to be using it from this side, which means I don't really want the extraction to be poking out towards me. So you can actually have it going around both from the front and the back, which is nice about this. And then we'll just attach those little screws in order to fix it to the base. Next, we'll get the old fence attached, slide it in like that. Let's get it centralized roughly by eye and then lock it down. Just two locks on this one. There isn't anything up at this end. Might've been nice to have a third lock there possibly, but realistically that's pretty well locked down. And then we'll set the depth of the cut. So plunge it down until the cutter hits the base and then loosen the rod, push it down and then zero that on zero. And in this instance, we'll cut down 10 millimeters. So I'll just lift that up until we get up to 10, lock it down. And I could actually do this in a couple of increments by the looks of it. So I'm going to rotate this round so that first we hit this stop. That's probably going to plunge down about five millimetres or so. And then once we've done that cut, flip it round and then it will do the final cut at the 10 millimetres there. As for extraction, that will just slot straight into there. And you can see this is where that ball and socket joint might be useful. If you need to hook it that side of the hose or that side, then it makes it a bit easy. But in this case, there we go. So we're pretty much all set up for our first cut, but I just want to go over the use of this before it starts making too much noise and you can't hear me. The trigger on this, let me just bring that up a bit. The trigger I find is, it's somewhat unresponsive and that might be down to the fact that this is a soft start motor. It's not something that kicks when you start it up. There's a nice gradual acceleration to it as it picks up speed. What I mean by the fact it's unresponsive is if you pull that trigger down and start it up and then accidentally take pressure off of it, that's obviously gonna start slowing down the cutter. But then if you immediately put pressure on it again in order to bring up the speed, it doesn't kick in instantly. You'll press the trigger and then it will take half a second, maybe a second in order to start picking up speed again. So you've got to be careful that you haven't accidentally got it engaging in any material while it starts picking up that speed again or else it might start kicking. Make sure it's completely clear, make sure it gets up to full speed and then lock the trigger in place. The other nice thing about it that I did forget to mention earlier was the fact that it has LEDs around the cutting area as well, which makes it incredibly easy to see what you're doing. So I'll just quickly demonstrate that unresponsive trigger and then, uh, then we'll actually cut this groove. So you can see it's probably about half a second or so and if you're aware it's going to happen then it's not much of an issue but yeah it's just something to be aware of when using the machine make sure full speed and then lock it in anyway i've been talking about And there you go, without spending hours demonstrating every single routing operation you can possibly do with this thing, that is my comprehensive overview slash review of the Bosch GMF 1600 router. As I said, if you want to purchase one of these things, using the link in the description will give me a little bit of a commission at no extra cost to you and is a great way of sending me a little tip as a thank you for the recommendation. But as an overview of everything that I've said in this video, it is an awesome bit of kit this and has saved me a lot of money. The fact that I've been able to essentially get two routers in one, one to have under the table, one to have on top of the table, not to mention the fact that it saved me on buying a router lift mechanism because it's all built into this fixed base. Like that for me was just an instant win anyway. I've also used this particular router with the Starship Enterprise, sorry, I mean the, um, the guide rail adapter. I used this during my power tool workbench build. There's also a link to that in the description if you're interested. 
The downside for me, it would probably be attaching the extraction using these little screws. It would be nice if it was all integrated into the extraction attachments, much like they are on the Festool, but it's not the end of the world. And obviously that intermittent switch can be inconvenient at times, but you, you soon get used to it, to be honest. But like other than that, there's really not a lot I can knock about this tool. If there was anything that did catch you out with it, such as things malfunctioning or not working as they should, you're obviously covered by Bosch's three-year warranty anyway, which from what I've seen and heard is pretty reliable anyway. So thank you very much for watching this video. I really hope you found it useful. If you go ahead and buy the router or not, please make sure that you press the like button below. That really helps me out. And if you haven't already, please subscribe for more reviews, tips, tricks, tutorials, projects on all sorts of woodworking topics. But thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.